Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, bed crimers. As always, I wish you the best. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out my channel. Let me just ask that after listening to or watching this video, if you learned something or enjoyed it, please do me a favor and smash that like button. Now, let's dig in. Well, hello, people. Hope you're well. During the course of the Lori Vallow trial, we've heard graphic testimony about how the remains of Lori's children, Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, were found buried in Chad Daybell's backyard. J.J. was carefully and precisely buried. Tylee was not. Her remains were in pieces, showing signs of charring, and were thrown into the dirt like scraps for wild hogs. The two different burial styles are symbolic, in my opinion, and they reflect how the perpetrators felt about J.J. and Tylee. Clearly, Tylee was not afforded any of the gentleness or care in death that J.J. was. Ever curious about what drives people to commit these heinous crimes, I did some research on the psychology of perpetrators who dismember victims and how hard it is to dismember a body. Not a happy topic for sure, but definitely a fascinating one. And just a warning, if you find this graphic stuff disturbing, you might want to skip this video. Let's begin with the difficulty involved in such an act. Listen to what Ashley Banfield of News Nation said about that last night. It is not easy to do it. And I'll tell you what else is not easy. Burning a body. No, you don't just start your campfire and burn a body. It doesn't work that way. It is far more complex than that. And Manfield brought in Dr. Jan Garavaglia, better known as Dr. G, of the Dr. G Medical Examiner Show on Discovery to weigh in on the topic. Listen to what Dr. G said. It is not an easy process. It's not as though you can just take the kitchen knife and finish the job, is it? Right. It, it is a very difficult process. And actually, what they testified to today that um, Laurie told her was it was messy and there's a lot of blood and it involves bleach and plastic bags. And that's true. And as we know from the testimony, either a knife, a hatchet, a machete, or a cleaver was used to dismember Tylee. It's also possible that several of these items were used during that process. It's beyond belief. Dr. G said that to do this act effectively, the perpetrator should concentrate first on the joints. Makes sense. Seems like a logical place to go. Hope you never do that. Hope I never do that. Dr. G said that Tylee being in so many pieces indicates that after cutting at the joints, whoever did this did a lot of chopping. I'm sorry to say that. Please know that the forensic pathologist who testified said these injuries were made post-death, so Tylee was deceased before all this horrible stuff was done to her body. I believe it takes a special sort of crazy to be able to even consider doing this to a person, let alone following through with that idea. So I decided to do some research on the psychology behind dismembering a body. And I found an interesting article from the Nation Thailand newspaper about just this topic. You heard that right, a Thai newspaper had an article about the psychology of dismemberment. The article was written after the death of a Spanish businessman whose dismembered remains were found in a river in Thailand. A Thai psychologist named Wanlup Payamanotham, I know for a fact I just butchered that, was asked to explain his thoughts on the psychology behind perpetrators who choose to undertake the difficult and messy task. I know this is a really dark topic. I'm going to refer to this psychologist as Dr. Wanlop 
because I know I will butcher his last name if I try to repeatedly pronounce it. Pun intended. We need a little levity for this topic. Dr. Wanlop said the perpetrator of the crime against the Spanish businessman likely held a grudge against the victim and dismembered the body both to express rage and to try and conceal the crime. So dismemberment can be about both emotion and practicality. The perpetrator may be venting his or her rage on the victim through this gruesome task, and the perpetrator is likely hoping that this method of disposal will help him or her conceal the body and maybe also prevent the body from being identified. Per the article, studies have found that perpetrators who do this to their victims are characterized by a form of subconscious cruelty and can be broadly categorized into three different groups. The first group is composed of people who are familiar with dismemberment from their previous life experiences, such as medical professionals or butchers. Butchers might be desensitized to this messy act, even if what they're dealing with is a human being instead of an animal. This brings to mind two fascinating cases. The first is, of course, Jack the Ripper. Jack targeted ladies, some of whom were rumored to be ladies of the night, and all the victims were attacked either in or around the Whitechapel section of London. Jack's preferred method of killing was using a knife to cut the throats of his victims. He would then mutilate their bodies in such a way that it seemed to indicate he had some knowledge of human anatomy. At one point, the police were sent a package containing exactly one half of a kidney, a human kidney. One of the suspects ripperologists have put forth over the years is a guy named Jacob Eisenschmid. Jacob was a butcher who was often spotted walking around Whitechapel in his leather apron and carrying a large knife. The locals even nicknamed him the Mad Pork Butcher. Jacob's landlord told the police that he would often stay out all night and was absent on the evening of victim Annie Chapman's murder. I could go on all day about Jack the Ripper, but this video is about dismemberment, so let us move on. The second case I thought of is that of the Black Dahlia. The case was named the Black Dahlia by the press at the time because of the victim's penchant or pension for wearing sheer black dresses and for the movie The Black Dahlia, which was out in theaters at the time of the crime. This famous unsolved case occurred in Los Angeles in the 1940s, a time when women wore dresses with nipped in waist and full skirts as well as hats and gloves. Very elegant. Think Ginger Rogers, Ava Gardner, Elizabeth Taylor. You get the idea. On January 15th of 1947, the lifeless body of a raven-haired 22-year-old woman named Elizabeth Short was discovered in tall grass in a field at 39th Street and Norton, not far from the Limert Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. Short had movie star looks and had dreamed of being an actress. Here's how she was described in an article from 1947. And by the way, this was after the crime. This is how she was described. Female, American, 22 years, 5 feet 6 inches, 118 pounds, black hair, green eyes, very attractive, bad lower teeth, fingernails chewed too quick, end quote. A young mother named Betty Bersinger was taking her child for a walk when she stumbled upon the gruesome sight. Elizabeth had been sliced clean in half at the waist. The body was just a few feet from the sidewalk and was posed in such a way 
that the mother thought at first that it was a broken store mannequin. The body was also incredibly pale, which added to the illusion of it being a mannequin. There were three-inch gashes on each side of Elizabeth's mouth going up to her ears, creating an effect known as the Glasgow smile, basically a fake macabre smile. One breast was slashed open, rope marks marred her wrists and ankles, and a section of her flesh had been removed from her thigh and then inserted into her body. Despite the extensive cuts made to young Elizabeth, there was not one drop of blood at the scene, and her body had been washed absolutely clean. This indicated that the young woman had been done in and sliced up somewhere else and then brought to this field for dumping. When the police arrived on scene, finding no purse or ID, they had no clue who the young woman was. The ensuing investigation, led by the LAPD, was aided by the FBI, who quickly identified the body. In fact, it took only 56 minutes for them to identify her. Record time in 1947, when there was no such thing as the internet. The investigators took fingerprints from the body using something called sound photo. And this was basically a primitive fax machine used by news services. Despite the fingerprints being kind of blurred in the image, they quickly matched up with a woman named Elizabeth Short. It turns out that Elizabeth had been arrested by the Santa Barbara police for underage drinking in 1943. Thus, the FBI had both her fingerprints on file and a mugshot which, by the way, is a testament to her beauty. Even in a mugshot, Elizabeth's beauty shines through. When investigators examined the cuts made to her body, they realized that the perpetrator had major skills in dissection. The body was so cleanly cut that FBI agents thought that it had to have been the work of a surgeon. Agents were even sent to check out a group of students at the University of Southern California's medical school. As the police were investigating the case, on January 24th, a package arrived at the Los Angeles examiner's office. It contained several of Elizabeth's belongings, including photos, her birth certificate, her social security card, and an address book, which had the name of Mark Hansen on the front of it. Hansen was a nightclub owner who was actually friends with Elizabeth and with whom she had stayed for a couple of nights before her death. Gasoline had been used to wipe the package clean of fingerprints. Whoever committed this crime was exceptionally savvy in evading the law. As for suspects, there were many. The one that stands out most to me is a guy named Walter Bailey. Walter Bailey's daughter knew Elizabeth's sister, and Walter had an office near the Biltmore Hotel, which was where Elizabeth had last been seen alive. In addition, her body was dumped a block away from Bailey's ex-wife's house. Bailey also matched the profile of the perpetrator that was drawn up by celebrated FBI profiler John Douglas. As a surgeon, Bailey would have been desensitized to blood and comfortable with sharp objects. Note that Elizabeth's body was also found two days after the anniversary of Bailey's son's death. Apparently his son had died. Tragically, to this day, no one knows for sure who took Elizabeth's life. The second category of perpetrators who dismember bodies per Thai psychologist Dr. Wanlup, are people who've suffered a trauma of some sort, perhaps from being assaulted, and they are people who often suppress their pain and rage. Dr. Wanlup wrote that former victims might later in life commit crimes 
to release these hidden feelings. He then described a young boy who witnessed his parents being killed by strangulation. The boy survived the attack and in adulthood went on to commit crimes himself. His MO became strangling and then dismembering victims. Reading this made me think of Brian Koberger. If he is found to be the perpetrator of the crime in Moscow, Idaho, then I feel he falls into this category. Now, as far as I know, Koberger never witnessed anything as traumatic as what this young boy did, but we know he was severely bullied in middle and high school. He was way overweight, so much so that that he needed a tummy tuck after he lost like a hundred pounds. I'm sure he was jeered at for his weight. We all know how cruel people can be. I was going to say kids, but I think adults can also be very cruel. We also know that Koberger was rejected and he described his feelings vividly in his postings to the Visual Snow Sufferers online message board. While the perpetrator in Moscow did not dismember the victim's bodies, he did use a sharp object, and he did, at least on victim Kaylee Gonsalves, use that object not just to jab, but also to tear holes in the skin from what the coroner, Kathy Mabbitt, described. Also, Kaylee's father supported that, and I believe that he saw her body when she was at the funeral home being prepared for the service. In my opinion, that is mutilation, and it hints at the perpetrator having intense rage suppressed below the surface that finally and suddenly exploded on the early morning in November of 2022. The third category of perpetrators who engage in dismemberment are people who suffer acute psychotic episodes associated with rage. Per the article, and I now quote, here comes another difficult to pronounce Thai name, Nati Jitsalong. Notice how I tried really hard to get that pronunciation right? Are you laughing right about now? I am. A criminologist and former director general of the corrections department said murderers who dismember the bodies of their victims often display other deviant behavior and a tendency toward excessive cruelty. He said such individuals might appear normal in ordinary circumstances, although they might be introverted. Natty agreed that murders involving dismemberment were often linked to a killer's professional experience or childhood trauma. Jeffrey Dahmer, the infamous serial killer out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, my hometown, by the way, props for any cheeseheads out there, falls into this third category. He dismembered 17 males between 1978 and 1991. Dahmer was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, and a psychotic disorder. In his childhood, he became subdued after a double hernia surgery shortly before his fourth birthday. In elementary school, his teachers found him to be quiet and timid. One teacher said, she detected early signs of abandonment in him due to his father, Lionel's frequent absence and his mother's illnesses. Lionel Dahmer was still a student of chemistry when Jeffrey was in elementary school, and Joy Dahmer, Jeffrey's mom, is widely believed to have been a hypochondriac who suffered from depression and spent much time in bed. She allegedly attempted to commit suicide as well. Jeffrey Dahmer later say he felt unsure of the solidity of the family as a child. He recalled extreme tension in the family home and numerous arguments between his parents. I'm always struck by how important a child's early years are in terms of their healthy development. If only parents were required to study healthy parenting 
and to get licensed before they're allowed to have an innocent child to rear. Okay, well, that's it for this very disturbing topic. YouTube is definitely not going to monetize this video. Let me just say that if you believe in my work here and if you prefer videos where I use the actual terminology for things like murder, please consider donating to my channel or getting a membership. My memberships are only $1.99 per month and I'm working on creating additional content for my very special members. If you can't afford that, know that I still love ya. Maybe you can do me the favor of smashing that like button each and every time. Speaking of time, until the next time on Bed Crime Stories.